In this video, we're going to take an at-a-glance look at the Photoshop CS5 user interface. Now, I'm going to more or less start from the top and go down toward the bottom. There's going to be a little jumping around, though. Now, the idea that I need you to keep in mind is that I'm not here to go into each and every button, knob, switch, and dial that you see before you. I really just want to get you familiar with what it is you're looking at in general so that you can start getting more specific as you move forward learning how to use Photoshop. So for starters, we all need to be on the same page. And what I want you to do, if you're following along, is to go up to the top of the Photoshop CS5 interface and Toward the right hand side, you'll see these three buttons, Essentials, Design, and Painting. I want you to make sure you click on the Essentials layout. What this is going to do is reconfigure all of Photoshop's interface to coincide with this Essentials layout. Now, if you have at any point while you've been using Photoshop, maybe you've moved some things around, adjusted some panels, maybe you grabbed you know, a certain panel and just stuck it out in the middle of the screen like so. That's going to make things a little harder to follow along. So if you come all the way over to the edge here, you have this double arrow button. We're going to come down to Reset Essentials. And with that, everybody should be on the same page looking at the exact same thing. So the workspace at a glance, or the user interface. Adobe calls it the workspace. Uh, in, ge in general, it is a user interface. At the very top, you have what is called the application bar. Now, this is specific to Photoshop, but you will see something very similar to it if you were to use other Adobe products, uh, such as Illustrator or After Effects. Uh, the interface of the CS5, uh, well, the creative suite itself has been very unified so you'll see a lot of this kind of stuff uh, as you move from one application to the next now across the top of this uh, we have several different controls not all of which I'm going to go into in depth but of particular note is the ability to access Adobe bridge which is a file browser allowing you to dig through any uh, any images that you have on your computer along with some other functionality that we will talk about a little later down the road uh, we can open up mini bridge which is the same as bridge but it exists only inside of a single panel here in the interface, where Bridge itself is an entirely separate application. Uh, we have the ability to, to adjust some settings on our document, not all of which I'm going to go into right now. Now, as we move across, we have the ability to change what our workspace looks like. So as you saw earlier, we set this over to Essentials. We could also set it over to a Design Layout, which changes some of the panels available over here on the right-hand side, to Painting as well. And if you click on the little double arrow here, there are even more that are available. But of course, for now, we're just going to leave this set to Essentials. Now over here on the far right hand side, we have the button for CS Live. CS Live is a collaboration and online tool uh, for the, the creative suite. As of right now, at the time of this recording, the online services for CS Live are complementary. That is going to cease to be the case on April 12th, 2012, I believe. So if you're watching this video and it's after April 12th, 2012, uh, this will become a paid service. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. Now, down underneath the application bar, actually, technically a part of the application bar, if you wanted to get really, you know, hardcore about it, we have the main menu bar. And this has a lot of the things that you're used to seeing in other applications, uh, such as a file menu, uh, so you can open up new files, etc. and so forth. Uh, we have edit, and of particular note in here is where you're going to find undo, uh, as if you decided to, you know mess something up. Uh, of course, that's just control Z. I'll get that out of the way now. So if you're completely new to Photoshop, get used to tapping control Z. Uh, we have a, the image menu, which allows you to control kind of what's going on with your image. The layer menu, which is several different settings pertaining to layers and how they're working. Uh, the select menu, which helps you control selections and edit, create new types of selections, etc. The filter menu, which is going to allow you to perform a variety of special effects on an image. Analysis, which is going to give you access to various measurement tools for different types of information on your image itself. The 3D menu, which is only available inside of Photoshop Extended. This allows you to uh, perform various operations on 3D objects, such as OBJ files that you can actually bring into Photoshop. You can rotate around, adjust the textures on, and so forth. View allows you to control what it is you're looking at here inside of Photoshop. It has uh, certain controls over the interface itself, uh, such as do you want to see rulers? Do you want to snap to any kinds of guides? Do you want to create new guides and several other controls as well. We have the window menu. This is where you can access all of the other hidden parts of the user interface. And as we start talking about specific parts of the UI, uh, we're going to be jumping into here to open up various parts that are not available by default. And then finally, if you're totally new to Photoshop, this is probably the most helpful <laughs> 
There you go. Uh, the most important menu of them all. Uh, this is the help menu, and this is where you can find the very nicely written Photoshop help. Uh, so if you click on this, you get a nice little browser, and we won't worry about updates at the moment. But if you're totally new to Photoshop, do not be afraid uh, to jump around in here. There's all kinds of great information available inside the very nicely laid out help file. Now, moving down from here, we have the options bar. Now, I'm not going to dig into what this is doing at all. I just want to give you a general overview of the fact that this is a context-sensitive part of the interface that is going to change as you click on different tools. So if I come over here to the tools panel on the left-hand side of the screen and I click on various tools, it doesn't even really matter which tool, you're going to notice that the options bar will update for various options and settings for each individual tool. And that's really the biggest thing that you need to be aware of, is that it is a context-sensitive part of the interface that is going to constantly be updating as you jump from one tool to the next. Now, if we move down from there, I'm going to start on the left and kind of work my way over toward the right. We have, as I mentioned a second ago, the Tools Panel. Now, the biggest job of the Tools Panel is to give you access to all of the tools you're going to be using as you work with Photoshop. Uh, things like the Move Tool, things like the Paintbrush, and, well, really, anything that you're going to use to manipulate something on your canvas is going to be available here inside the Tool Menu. Now, as you get toward the bottom, there's some other features uh, for it as well. Uh, we have some navigation tools, for, such as the Hand Tool, which will allow us to pan around a canvas, and the Zoom Tool. Uh, without getting too far into those right now, because we're going to talk about navigating a little bit later, uh, uh, and in just a moment, I will open up a canvas so that we can uh, see some sort of an image. Down here on the bottom, we also have our color selection area. This allows us to choose what our foreground color is going to be. So we get a color picker where we can set this to any shade of the rainbow that we like. We also have a background color, and those will become a little more important to work with later on. Now, the big blank area that we have here is where your canvas is going to be while you're working with an image. Currently we don't have an image open, that doesn't help us too much, so what I'm going to do is go to File, Open, and here I am inside the Sample Pictures folder for the pictures that come along with uh, Windows 7. And I'm going to grab the koala picture, because the koala is awesome, and here we are now with a canvas available here inside the middle of our view, and you can see what this looks like. You've got a tab at the top telling you what image you have open. Uh, you've got a little zoom factor down here at the bottom telling you this is currently zoomed to 66.67%, and if you're trying to find my cursor, it is at the lower left corner of the video right now. If I was to type in 100%, you'll see we zoom into 100% like so. We get the amount of, let me not go all the way down to Windows so my start bar doesn't come up. We have the amount of memory being taken up by this image, and of course we've got scroll bars to the left and right. So navigation is something that we'll come to a little bit later. Now on the right hand side of the Photoshop interface, we have probably the most important area. It's going to be changing probably more than any other part of the interface uh, as you get used to using Photoshop. Eventually you'll probably find a layout, a setup for this uh, that works just right for you and then it will stop changing quite so much. But this is the panel area and this contains a variety of different panels uh, to give you access to various settings, uh, features, tools, lots of different things here inside of Photoshop. Now it comes in a couple of different uh, uh, we'll call them flavors for now. We've got a little crushed down version over here, a little tiny area that gives us access to mini bridge, which I can click on. You'll notice the MB there. So we can collapse that back down. And then we have access to the history window as well. So if I click this, everything that I do gets recorded in history. And we'll talk specifically about history and how it affects working with documents inside of Photoshop a little bit later on. Now, if we move over to the panels proper, we see at the very top the color panel, and this just allows you a quick access to a color picker. So we have a rainbow where we can kind of drag to a specific color, and then we have sliders for red, green, and blue to uh, select exactly which color we want. Now, there are some various settings for this, but again, I want to keep things very general. If you'd like to pick from a predetermined list of colors, you can switch over to the swatches panel. And you can see those as well. And you're more than welcome to create your own swatches if you have a new color that is not listed here. For example, uh, I could come over to my color picker, which we talked about just a little while ago on the left-hand side of the screen at the bottom of the tool panel. And I could grab some outrageous shade of green, which is just perfect for whatever it is I'm doing. And then if I click on the new button here, I've just created a brand new swatch. So again, I really didn't want to get too far into this, but if you really do like the idea of swatches, but you're, you feel limited by the amount of, uh, of selection that you have there, that's a real quick way to add new ones. Next, we have the Styles tab. This will not be particularly useful until we start getting into layer styles, which are a very, it's a very in-depth uh, topic that we're not going to get into at the moment. 
in short, what they are is a variety of settings and special effects that can be applied to the pixels in an individual layer to give you things like a chrome look or like a drop shadow look and things like that. Now if we move down from this panel where we have color swatches and styles, we have another area which has two tabs giving us adjustments and masks. The adjustments uh, panel is going to allow us to create adjustment layers and there's a lot of different kinds here. As you mouse over each one of these, you'll see what they are. And We have uh, brightness contrast, levels, curves, etc. and so forth. Just to give you a quick idea of what this is here for, I'm going to move over the hue saturation button which is on the second row, second one over, and we'll just click on that. And what this has done is this has created a new hue saturation layer. This is a layer which sits on top of our current document, and not to get too much into layer theory or anything, but allows us to change the hue of our image. So you notice everything kind of now shifting over to a blue. We can change the saturation, really increase that. In fact, we can start to blow it out and make everything look kind of gross. And we can change the lightness as well. The, the idea is just give you an idea of... <laughs> to give you a general overview of what an adjustment layer is and why this panel is here. It allows you to create and adjust the settings on these adjustment layers. Now down here on the bottom I have a back button so if I want to create more of these I can just click on the next one. For the time being though I am going to get rid of that layer by undoing. Uh, to undo back far enough I'm going to hit control, alt, and the Z key and do that again one more time and that will get rid of that layer taking us right back to where we were. Next we have the mask tab, or masks plural tab. Now I'm not going to go into a lecture over masks right now, but in short, what a mask is, is a way for you to control where a particular effect or layer is taking place. You can you control the visibility of a layer on a pixel by pixel basis. And once we start working with and creating those masks, we can jump into this tab to create, or I'm sorry, to adjust a variety of settings for each one of those masks. Now moving down from here, we have another area which has three tabs being layers, channels, and paths. The layers panel gives you access to all of the various layers of your document. Now what a layer is, is kind of like a sheet of, well not necessarily transparency, but generally it is like a sheet of transparency that you can uh, draw on. Now currently I have a background layer and that's not going to be transparent at all. Uh, it's just kind of like a sheet of paper, or I, I guess you could look at it kind of like a printout of our koala picture. Now again, without trying to, to you know, take things a little too far, if we look down here at the bottom of the layers panel, there is a new layer button. It's, it looks like a little piece of paper with the uh, lower left corner folded up. And if I click on this, I get a brand new blank layer. It's it's almost exactly like Photoshop has taken a layer of uh, acetate or um, transparency paper, or not even paper, just like plastic, and it's put it down over the top of my background image, and now I can paint on that, and this is on its own sheet. I can move it around, I can switch its visibility on and off, and at its most basic level, that is the purpose of layers, so that you can take your work, take various things that you're doing, and separate them into different sheets of your document, so that you don't have to do everything to the exact same uh, level, or say the exact same layer of your document. It's just a kind of a, uh, an organizational system. So I'll go ahead and remove that. Now the way I did that, uh, I didn't even think about it. Let me go ahead and just kind of do that a little more slowly. If I click and drag on this layer, I can drag it down to the little tiny trash can in the lower right hand corner and that throws that away. And we're going to be talking a lot more about layers, how they work, and a lot of the really cool things you can do with them as we move on through this series of videos. Next panel over we have channels. Now to give just a little bit of background on the idea of a channel, when you are looking at an image inside of Photoshop, you're looking at a bunch of pixel data. Inside of a computer, your pixels are receiving color information on multiple channels. These can be uh, these channels include color information for the color red, the color green, and the color blue in terms of RGB. It could also be a uh, CMYK, meaning it would be cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Uh, and I'm, try I'm not trying to compound things. For now, all we see is RGB, so let's just stick with that. As I click on each one of these channels, you can see how much data for that particular color is being broadcast on each pixel of the image. So for now, if I click on red, the white areas are showing the maximum amount of red that's being applied and the black areas are showing absolutely no red and all the shades of, of gray in between are kind of mapping out how much value red is receiving for each pixel, which is why everything went to black and white. If we switch down to green, 
This gives you feedback as to uh, how much green information on a pixel by pixel basis, and then finally how much blue. Now the reason he's not changing color too much is that our koala is actually primarily gray. And gray is going to be a fairly equal mix of red, green, and blue. Uh, that's just kind of how it works. Now if I was to zoom in, which I'm going to do by tapping the Z key, and then I'll just kind of drag right here by the eye and get us really close to the eye, you'll notice that things are, if I switch back over to the red channel, you'll notice things are really bright here around the eye where you've got that kind of pink colored skin. But then as I switch over to green, it's a lot darker around through there. Now if I really wanted to show that off, a way that I could do that is to go back over to File, Open, and let's grab something with some really vibrant color, like this chrysanthemum image. Now if we switch back over to our channels one more time, you'll notice the results are a lot more dramatic. So right now we're looking at RGB. This is the result of our red, green, and blue channels simultaneously. I can click on red and everything is almost completely white. That's because there's a whole lot of red in this image. But if I switch to green, things get a lot darker. There is a little bit of green being used with the red to blend out and get a lot of those natural tones, but not very much. And of course blue, there's really almost none whatsoever. It's only when you combine all three of them that you get the final result in the color. So hopefully that, that helps make sense as to what channels are. It's really just a way for you to see how much color information for each of your primary colors is being broadcast to each individual pixel. Finally, we have paths. Now paths are vector shapes that uh, can be drawn on your document uh, in the form of Bege curves. Now I don't really want to turn this into a great big long lecture on paths, but we can grab the pen tool, which you can click at. It's a, a little lower than halfway down the tools panel, or you can just hit the P key to activate it. And I can click drag on a couple of locations here inside my document. And I am creating a Bege curve as I do that. So I just clicked and dragged three times. And I have uh, now created this curve, this path, if you will. And we can see that a work path does indeed appear here inside my paths uh, panel. Now, I'm not going to go uh, into a big, long lecture as to all of the different things that paths can do. And they can do a lot of things in Photoshop. Uh, you can use them for creating various shapes to contain certain colors or effects. You can use them to warp text. Uh, there's all kinds of very useful ways that you can employ uh, vector shapes or these, uh, these Bege curves also known as paths, but again, that's kind of outside the scope of this general lecture. I just threw that path away by dragging it down to the trash can in the lower right-hand corner of this, uh, this panel, and really, that's pretty much it. The only other thing I do kind of want to mention to you is that all of these panels, on all these panels, you're going to see a little tiny icon in the lower right-hand side, I'm sorry, the upper right-hand side, I do know uh, top from bottom, uh, where you can see a variety of menu options that appear. Now, I don't want to dig into what each one of these do, but it is going to be unique for each one of these panels. So if we go over to the Layers panel and I click on this, you'll notice we have New Layer, Duplicate Layer, New Group, etc. and so forth. If I jump over to Channels, and I click on that same button again, it's a new menu containing various options specifically for channels. So these little panel menus are context sensitive for whatever panel you happen to be looking at at the time. I just wanted to mention so that you know that they're, uh, they're there. Finally, this, uh, this panel area can be expanded and collapsed. So if we click collapse to icons, which is this little tiny double arrow in the corner, we can minimize that down and open up a little more workspace, which is really nice if you're trying to make the most of your canvas area. So that is the Photoshop user interface at a glance. Really quick review of what we've discussed. We have the application bar at the very top. It has a few options for our document, the ability to open up Bridge and Mini Bridge, as well as some presets that we can access for our workspace. We have the menu bar directly underneath this by default. Uh, we have the options bar, which is a context sensitive area that gives us various options for each one of the different tools that we have access to in Photoshop. Down from here on the left-hand side, we have the Tools Panel, which is a vertical strip that sits on the left-hand side. I do want to mention you will see a Collapse button in the top left corner of this as well. And if you click on this, you'll see that you can have one big long vertical strip, or it'll kind of double itself up, and that's a little more like old-school Photoshop. Uh, I actually like the big long vertical strip just because it gives me a little more workspace. Next, we have the Document Area, which is currently set to a tab mode. I'll talk about how we can adjust that and change it over to Floating Windows a little bit later. Next, we have the panel area, which can be expanded or collapsed. And actually, both areas of this can be expanded or collapsed, just so you know. So if we keep this 
crush down to icons, you see what we get here, but we can expand it out and we get mini bridge at the top and history down at the bottom, which that's nice, but we are really starting to eat up a lot of our real estate space on our screen. So it's just one of those things where, you know, maybe you have a huge monitor or maybe you have multiple monitors and you're fine with that, but uh, we'll talk about customizing the interface into something we like a little bit later. Next, we have the rest of the panel area, which breaks down into three main groups by default uh, with color swatches and styles at the top adjustments and masks at the, at the middle, and then layers, channels, and paths at the very bottom. And that is essentially everything you need to know about the Photoshop user interface, at least when you get started. And once again, I'm going to say user interface a lot, uh, but the technical Adobe term for it is your workspace. That is going to wrap things up for this video. Thanks a lot.